just now joining us for the first time when it comes to talking about the nine or whether you've been with us for part of it we're certainly glad that you're here excited about being able to wrap this up and share with you guys the final pieces the final episodes of the nine and next week is mother's day weekend it's going to be a great time around here to be able to come we're going to be doing two things to be able to celebrate mother's day around here one thing that we're doing is we're actually going to be providing a photo opportunity for for you moms to be able to come bring your family we're going to take photos of you. We're going to provide you with those digital. We're going to have backgrounds set up, and it's just going to be a great time to be able to come in, get some free photos, and we're going to be able to give those to you. Also, we're going to be celebrating Mom's Day by doing this. We're going to be having baptism next weekend as well, and we have about 20 people, I believe, already confirmed and signed up for that, and so we're going to just have an incredible turnout. If you're somebody that you've made that decision, you, you've trusted Jesus to be your Savior, but you've never been baptized since you've made that decision, We'd love to include you in on baptism this coming weekend. You can stop by the Welcome Center, sign up for that, or even find out more about that if you want to ask some questions about that. So we're talking about the nine, and what are the nine? The nine are these nine things, these nine attributes in our life that the Spirit of God is working inside of every believer to be able to produce these. And these are what we've looked at so far. We've looked at these six episodes, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. We've looked at these. And when it comes to this, this goodness piece, see, this goodness piece might be that for you, this is where you might be a little intimidated, especially for you if this is your first time to be in church or your first time in a very long time, that maybe for you it's very intimidating to be able to come into church and to walk in and go, I just don't know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, because I'm going to be surrounded by, by all of these good people, these people that are like really, really good. And, and, and me, I, I'm not so good. I, I don't know if I belong. And and you look around and you see a bunch of smiling faces. Well, don't, don't let the smiling faces confuse you. Because we're all sinners here. We are. And, and, and you might be sitting next to somebody that's out sinned you. Yeah. Not very comforting for you if you're the one that we're talking about. But this is a place that people come not because they're perfect. It's a place that people come because they're looking for hope. They're looking for encouragement. They're looking to be equipped. And so people that, that you already believe, you already put your faith, your trust in Jesus, you're coming and you're going, hey, equip me and encourage me. Or if you're not yet there when it comes to that belief, you're going, hey, what, what do you have? What do you have to offer? And so we are certainly glad that you are here if you're not yet convinced of who Christ is. And let's just start out by, by sharing this, that the goal for a Christian is to live a Christ-like life. So that's the goal. Everybody who's a Christ follower, that your goal is to live a Christ-like life. And we've been looking at this thing that we refer to as the fruit of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit wants to produce these specific things in our life. And we've taken the time to, to run through and push through six episodes already. And we're going to take this morning and we're going to finish up talking about this and we're going to be looking at, at the last three, seven, eight, and nine. But here's what's important to know. Just like you can't become a Christian on your own, you can't. It's the work of God in you. You cannot become Christ-like on your own either. That it's going to take the Spirit of God working in you and you pursuing that takeover, that you would welcome the Spirit of God to come in and to take over your life. And so that's what we've been looking at. Where is it that the Spirit of God wants to take over? And what would the Spirit of God produce if we would allow the Spirit of God to take over? So we're going to 
finish this up by hitting these last three episodes. So episode seven is faithfulness. It's faithfulness. So this is something that the Spirit of God wants to produce in our lives. Well, what is faithfulness? Faithfulness is steadfast allegiance. That's what it is. It's this steadfast allegiance that, that it just doesn't waver. It is all in. And, and a person who is faithful is a person of integrity. It's a person that doesn't just say you can count on them, but you know that you can count on them. Because it's not just about what they're saying. It is what they are doing. They have the follow through. When, when it comes to faithfulness, there, there's some standouts. That faithfulness is constant. Faithfulness is constant. That faithfulness is one of these things that it doesn't like come and go and you don't know when it's going to be there and when it's not. That's not faithfulness. Faithfulness is constant. That, that faithfulness, when we think about what faithfulness is, faithfulness is a full time state of mind. It's full time and it's all the time. That is faithfulness. Faithfulness is careful. It's careful. That faithfulness is this thing that, that when you're a faithful person, you're looking out. You're looking out far ahead and looking at where you're going in life and what's coming up and what you're doing. Because you're looking, because you're trying to identify what are any of those hazards that are out there. Because I don't want to hit any of those hazards. I want to remain faithful. So I'm looking so that I can make adjustments early on to make sure that I can remain faithful to whatever hazards are going to come in and try to knock me off course from being faithful because faithfulness stays on guard. It stays on guard, that, that, that you're on guard to protect your faithfulness. Faithfulness is committed. That, that is this thing that when it comes to faithfulness, it's this thing that's very dependable, that, that we depend on commitments when we're faithful because we take things like our words, and we treat them as if they are a vow, like a sacred pact. Because what we said was something that we're going to stand by when we are faithful. And faithfulness, faithfulness is this thing that leads to relational fulfillment. And it leads to this incredible relational fulfillment because of these three things, because faithfulness is constant, faithfulness is careful, faithfulness is committed kind of relationships that we want to have with people are relationships where we know people are going to be faithful. Faithful to their friendship, faithful to their vows. We want faithful people. Men, let me just speak to you for just a moment. See, we have something that, that we're going to be doing for the next five weeks that I believe is going to help you, strengthen you in this area of faithfulness, of being faithful to God, being faithful to others. That for the next five weeks on Wednesday nights, we're going to be doing a two-hour study that's going to help you and strengthen you and equip you, encourage you to be faithful. Faithful to God and faithful to your relationships. And it's, it's something that's going to be a $10 study for all five weeks. We're also going to be offering child care as an option if that's something that you want to take advantage of. There's going to be details for that. You can look at those in your connection. You can look at those online and still sign up. But it is a way that you... You can say, hey, I want to take faithfulness seriously. And so what can I be doing to make sure that I can grow in my commitment to being faithful, faithful to God and faithful to people? So when we think of faithfulness, there's some, there's some other words that come to mind. Loyalty, trustworthy, dependable. These, these are words that all stand out. To, 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 to be somebody who's faithful is to be somebody who's wholly devoted you're wholly devoted to a person, to a cause, or to an ideal. That, that is you. You would be completely, wholeheartedly devoted. You know, Jesus spoke about the measurement of responsibility when it comes to fulfillment. When it comes to, I'm sorry, when it comes to faithfulness. And what he said is here and found in Luke chapter 16, verse 10. He says, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things then you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. So when it comes to being faithful, where we need to start with our faithfulness 
is being faithful to God. In fact, God actually took and he, he took this specific group of people to say, I want you to be my nation. He actually started with one guy. So I, I want to start a people group, a nation with you that's going to be blessed above all other nations. And in our Bible, when we get into the second book, right after the first book, the first book is Genesis, means beginning. Then we have the book of Exodus. Our second book means to exit out of. And it's about the, the exodus of leaving slavery behind because God's people group had been captive. And leaving that behind and exiting out and heading into the promised land. And it's in this book of Exodus that, that we find how God gives us instruction. He has 10 instructions for life. We remember them, if we've heard about these, we remember them as the 10 commandments. And inside the 10 commandments, we can look at the very first two, and the first two deal directly with our call to be faithful to God. So in Exodus chapter 20, starting in verse 3, it says, God said, you must not have any other God but me. He says, you want me to be your God? Then you're going to have to be faithful, and you're going to have to be faithful to, to me. And then verse 4, it's the second one. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. Maybe if these have been familiar to you for a while, maybe you remember the second one as no graven images. That's what this is. Don't, don't make anything that you're going to idolize. And when it came to this one, God actually gave us some commentary on this one. That he, that he explained this one. He expounded on it. So verse 5. You must not bow down to them, these things that you would create. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. God deserves our faithfulness. He deserves it for who he is and what he's done. And when he gets it, he rewards us. That when we choose to be faithful to God as he deserves, when we choose to do this, God rewards our faithfulness. The purpose of faithfulness is to give God permission to do his best work through us. So that's the purpose of being faithful. That God, I, I'm going to give you permission to do your best work through me. God, use me in whatever way you can, in whatever way you will, whatever way you desire, because I'm going to be faithful to you. And so just use me. This is the purpose of us being faithful to God. And the test of faithfulness comes along. And the test of faithfulness is believing that God is who he says he is. That, that, we have to, that we're going to be tested at times and we need to believe that God is who he says he is. Even when difficulties come along. It's maintaining faithfulness despite the difficulties. Of believing in God that he is who he claims to be and who he has shown himself to be. See, and when your faithfulness to God is a priority, not just a priority, when your faithfulness to God is the priority, then your faithfulness to people will persevere. That, that when you make it your priority and say, God, I'm, my faithfulness to you is the priority, that you're going to be faithful to him and being faithful to people, it's going to persevere. It's just going to come natural for you to be faithful to others when you choose to be faithful to God. And so here's the big question. See, because with every episode that we've looked at, we've said, hey, there's a question worth writing down. There's a question worth taking note of, writing this down, going back, reflecting on this, looking at this, evaluating our lives and seeing how we can improve and become more of who God wants us to be, that the Spirit of God would be working in us to produce. And so here's the big question for faithfulness. 
Am I faithful to God and others, even at my own expense, or do I protect my interests first? So this is a question that we all have to be asking. If we want to be serious about allowing the Spirit of God to produce in us faithfulness. Well, let's look at episode 8, which is gentleness. And if I'm gentle, I can spin this around without breaking anything. There we go. Gentleness. So what is this? Gentleness is a tender approach towards others' faults, weaknesses, and limitations. See, we all have these, right? We all have faults, we all have weaknesses, and we all have these limitations. Every single one of us. And because that's true of us, and we need people to be gentle to us, then that should be a reminder that we should choose to be gentle with others. Because we need gentleness. We also, in turn, should choose to be gentle. See, gentleness is, is telling the truth. It's speaking the truth with a tender tone. That's, that's what gentleness does. It said, I'm going to tell you the truth, but I'm not going to say it in a way that I'm going to belittle you or I'm going to lash at you. I'm going to do this in a gentle tone. See, gentleness is this power under control. That's gentleness. It's not weakness, it's gentleness. It's choosing to be gentle when you have the power to do more than just be gentle. It's been said when it comes to gentleness, that gentleness is a strong hand with a soft touch. That's what gentleness is. That strong, capable hand that chooses to use a soft touch. In our New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, we find this instruction for life. Always be humble and, help me out, gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. He said, make room. Make room for the faults that, that other people have because we all have faults. Be humble and be gentle. A gentle person still speaks the truth. It's just the way that they do it. it and, and as they speak the truth, a gentle person will even take the time to speak the painful truth but it's the way that they approach it they do it they do it in such a tone that they are trying to help somebody not trying to hurt somebody it's all about trying to help this book of wisdom proverbs chapter 15 verse 1 a gentle answer deflects anger but harsh words make tempers flare. I mean, haven't we all experienced this? We, we've all experienced it. We, we've seen the harsh words make the tempers flare, and we've seen the gentle words deflect the anger. So there's some benefits of gentleness. There's benefits. When we choose to be gentle, that there are benefits that we can reap, and other people are going to get the benefits as well. Here's some of the bennies. That, that, that when we come along and we say, hey, I'm going to be gentle, it disarms critics. The people that are being so critical of us and speaking into our lives and tell us all the negative and tell us all the things that are wrong. And, and when we just receive it gently and, and we, don't, we don't go off on them after they get critical with us, it just disarms the critics. Then another benefit is that it, dis, it diffuses the conflicts. Diffuses conflicts. That, that when you have somebody that you're doing life with and you're gentle with them, conflicts don't just keep rising up and getting out of control. It's where there's a lack of gentleness where the conflicts just keep escalating. And so the benefit of being gentle is it diffuses the conflicts. Another benefit is it deepens companionship. It deepens the companionship. It deepens the relationship and the closeness. When we choose and we make it a priority to be gentle with the people that we do life with. Could you imagine 
how much different our world would be if we, we had a world that was full of only people that were gentle. So this world would be a totally different place if every person on the planet was gentle. So I've been doing something for a couple of months that I've told a few people about and letting them know a little bit about what I'm doing. And they keep going, hey, well, well what, when are we going to hear about that on a Sunday morning? We, we want to hear about that. And so, so this is going to be that time. And, and for those of you guys that don't know anything about what I'm talking about, it's not even that exciting for me to even give that lead in. But, but here it is. I've been an Uber driver for the last two months. I've been doing this thing. It's just been a great social experiment for me. In fact, when I tell people about my Uber driving, what I tell them is Uber is paid entertainment. <laughs> it's just paid entertainment. I'm getting paid while I'm getting entertained as I'm driving people around. Now, part of it has to do with the hours that I keep. Because I, I'm, I'm not an early morning guy. I'm a late night guy, or maybe I am an early morning guy because I don't finish until the early morning. So, so I'm out there, and, and I'm, I'm Ubering. You know, I'll often get my start after 10 o'clock at night, and I'll go to 2 or 3 or a little after 3 in the morning when I do get out there and I choose to Uber. And so I, I was driving a weeknight this last week, and I was out, and i have been driving for quite a while, and I, I had a pickup that I picked up somebody at 2.20 at a dance club. And so I'm driving in, and I get there, and I pull up to the dance club. They had obviously shut down at 2 o'clock, and, and there's a bunch of people out front. And then you never know how many people you're going to get. You might get one, and, and, and with my ride that I have, it's going to be maxed out at four riders. So, so me and four is the max, so five of us total. Well, well, it turned out it was a group of four. And this group of four, they, they come up to the car, and so three of them pile in the back pretty quickly. And then there's this guy that walks up to the passenger door, and he, and he opens the door, and, and, and he's smoking, and, and he's going, hey, dude, can I, uh, can I smoke in the car? I said, no, man, I'm, I'm sorry. You're not going to be able to smoke in here. Oh, man, come on. And, and, he, and he said some words, and he was using some profane language and trying to encourage me to choose to let him smoke in the car. It's not even my car. I, I got a two-door. I can't use my car, so we're, I'm not even using my. No, I'm sorry. You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't smoke in the car. Oh, come on. His friends now are saying, no, you can't smoke in the car. Just get in the car. So he gets in the car. And then he points and he says, we're going over there. Now, I've had some short Uber trips before. And I've picked up some pretty inebriated people. But for me to pick you up at this club and take you across this side street, not a main street, to this taco place that's still open because they are located right next to the dance club. I'm just like going, okay. So I drive right over and I pull right up to the front, and he goes, oh, no, 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 we, we want to do the drive through You're going to take us home. And I said, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so I drive around to the drive through and I sit there, and I, I told him as I'm pulling around, I said, I'm going to roll down your window, the person behind me, and I'm going to let you do the ordering. And so I pull up, and they're all talking and trying to decide, and they're looking at the menu. It's been three minutes, and they still haven't come to us and said, would you like, what would you like to order? And the sign's really big right there, open 24 hours. drive through open 24 hours. But then that real small, it said Friday and Saturday nights. It was a weeknight. I looked at that and I said, uh, hey guys, they're not open. And they looked at it and of course they're, he's saying a few words. So they said, okay, well just, just take us home and, and we'll stop at McDonald's or Whataburger along the way. So I go, my little app tells me it's an 18-minute drive. And so we just start heading down. And so then the conversation begins. And he asks a question that I often would get asked, and it's, so how long have you been Ubering? And I said, well, about two months. And then he asked a follow-on question that I've come to expect up to this point. Is, is somebody that's wanting to know, so what do I do when I'm not Ubering, right? 
And so, so I'm usually well prepared for this, and I've got two different answers that I give. I've got the one answer that's, that's, that's this answer that says, well, I, I, I do several different things. You know, I, I, I'm a real estate investor. I own my own company. And, and then also, um, I do some motivational speaking. And so, so I, I just kind of give them that, that kind of an answer often, you know. And, and it depends on who it is and where they're at and what's kind of going on with it. If I give them that answer or if I let them know, really, what do I do? I'm a pastor full time with my life, right? So. But he asked the question in such a way. That was the answer I was going to give him, by the way. But, but the way he asked it, he said, so what do you do during the day when you're not Ubering? And I just paused for a minute. I'm like, how, how, can, I, how can I give him my, my answer I really would like to give him? And I couldn't. And so I just said, are you sure you want to know? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I, I want to know. I said, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, but, but I'm just not sure you really want to know. <laughs> to which he said, oh, it can't be that bad. <laughs> I said, no, don't get me wrong. I love what I do. It's not that. I'm just not sure you really want to know what I do. And he goes, well, I, I can handle it. Go ahead and tell me. So I said, well, I'm a pastor. I really expected him to answer with profanity. (laughs) But he didn't. Instead, he answered this way. Oh, no kidding. Well, I work for a Christian nonprofit. (laughs) I didn't see that one coming. (laughs) We end up having conversation that, the whole way, we're sitting at a McDonald's waiting for this meal to, to come in. And, and so we're just having conversation after conversation. After, and, and, and this conversation ends up being great. We have lots of talk about what's going on and what we do. And, all. and when I get to his drop-off point, and all four of them get off at the same place. And when I drop them off, he says, well, hey, do you, do you have a card for your T-shirt business? Because I, I'd love to, to see if we could get you some of the work. And so I gave him that card, and I gave him one of my own personal cards for here as well. He said, well, here's, here's my card for, for my church card. Do you know why I was able to do that? Gentleness. See, that's, that's why that, that, that when I was having conversation with him, that it didn't just all of a sudden just go, whoo, shut down. And him feeling judged. And him feeling small because of who I am. It's because I was gentle. Gentleness. It's, it's the power of choosing to be gentle. It, it's where there could be a strong hand, but it uses a very soft touch. Look at what Jesus said here in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you. This yoke, it's, it's a harness. It's something that they would use. So when you have that, you can be guided So Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. See, Jesus is humble and he's gentle and he's wanting to guide us to be more like him, that we should be gentle with others. Here's the big question when it comes to gentleness. Do I come across as overbearing or am I thoughtful? as I interact with others? So that's a question. We need to write this down. This is a question we need to go, I need to wrestle with this. I need to look at this. I need to evaluate. I need to find out where am I at? Because the more we pursue the takeover and allow God's spirit to come in and take over, the more we're going to be that person that's thoughtful as we interact with others. And the less we pursue that takeover and we just let our own thing happen, the more that we're going to be that person that's just over bearing. So what's the last one? The last one, episode nine for us, self-control. Self-control. So what is self-control? Self-control is using restraint when tempted to act selfishly. 
that it's that choosing to use restraint. Now, when it comes to self-control, we actually are doing something here today that, that you might need to exercise some self-control in. Because see, our Bling Women's Ministry is having a silent auction here today. And, and they've got some incredible things going that, that people have just donated to them. And that that's going to be a silent auction. And, and every dollar that, that gets bid, that get, that whoever that winning bid is and, and purchases that, is going to go to the Bling Ministry. And, and they're doing this because they, they have a desire to put on such a, a stronger program for this fall's women's retreat than what the budget allowed for them to do. And so they were just getting creative and said, hey, what, what could we do? And so there's some really great stuff. And if you've not picked out a Mother's Day gift yet, it might be a, a great way for you to go over there and do some Mother's Day shopping. But there's some stuff for guys over there as well. And there's a, a really cool cross that you can raffle. And there's another one that you can bid on. So great stuff over there. Well, self-control. We've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit. We've been looking at this, this passage in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But there is a word, there is a single word that is a big standout word when it comes to these two verses for fruit of the Spirit. Let me read this and see if you can pick it out. It says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. See, it's a standout word, but, but maybe it's not stood out to you. Maybe for you, maybe it hadn't registered. It's just a small word. It's just three letters. And here's the standout word. But. See, it's a word that's juxtaposing something else. And so let's just back up a little bit and hit verse 19 and look at, 19, 20, and 21, to see why we have this but in verse 22. It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, what, what Paul does as he's writing this, he gives us 15 specific examples of these things that, that we might be tempted to do and pursue just by living life without the Spirit's guidance in our life and just what we would do, what we would naturally pursue. And he lists these 15 specific things. And just in case yours isn't listed, he has the catch-all and other sins like these. <laughs> just to make sure. Because somebody's going to be looking at the list and going, oh, Whew. safe. And then he does that in other sins like, oh, man, me too. Listen. I want to mention somebody this morning, and I, and I don't want to mention them to judge them, but I want to mention them to show you the importance of self-control. To show you that, that whenever we skip out on it, we take a pass on self-control, that there's always a price tag that we're forced to pay later. Who I want to mention to you is Laramie Tunsil. A lot of the guys in the room know exactly who that is. Some of the ladies you might know too. But see, this is somebody that I didn't know about until Friday morning, listening to some talk radio. See, the NFL draft was Thursday this last week. And Laramie Tunsil was predicted to go round Pick three. I got to say it right. Predicted to go pick three. That, that, that he was expected to be the very third pick in the whole NFL draft. And, and Laramie Tunsil, he's a guy that went to University of Mississippi, six foot five, 310 pound offensive lineman. Powerhouse. 
See, for you to be able to get picked as third in the NFL draft this year, that is predicted to be a deal that is a four-year deal worth $25 million. But see, right before the NFL draft got its start, there was a short little video clip that hit social media with Laramie in it. And he was wearing a, a gas mask connected to a bong, smoking something. And you ended up having 10 teams that took a pass on Laramie because they saw that here's a guy that lacks some self-control. That price tag, for him to be the guy that was picked 13 instead of picked third, that price tag that he had no idea how much it was going to cost him until it happened, was a $13 million price tag. That's what it cost him. Because he didn't have self-control. So we never know the price tag up front. It's never posted. This is what it'll cost you if you choose to not exercise self-control. We only know the price that we are forced to pay after we choose to not have self-control. So what is this? It's self-control. It's the restraint and moderation. That's what it is. Simply put, it's restraint and moderation. Look at this, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 16. Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for things we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. See, self-control requires us to say one of the most difficult words to pronounce in our dictionary. Of all the words in our dictionary, the big ones, the small ones, this is the hardest word for us to pronounce when we're being tempted with something that's going to be self-gratifying in the moment, but it's not going to be good for us in the long run. It's not going to be good for our relationships with others. It's not going to be good for our commitment to God. And it is the most difficult word to pronounce. And it's just a two-letter word. No. No. To to exercise this self-control and to say no. Here's the big question. Are self-serving desires driving my life? Or am I allowing the Spirit to direct me? That's the big question. That's the question that we have to ask. When we look at our own lives and reflect and go, where are we at with the self-control? Are we inviting the Spirit in to control us? Are we pursuing the takeover so the Spirit will lead, guide, and direct our lives to where we can have the most satisfying life? See, when, when we invite the Spirit to come in and do the takeover, when we do this, that instead of living life for ourselves and getting a few immediate pleasures that are going to cost us In the long run, we get to live the most fulfilling, rewarding life that's going to prepare us for an incredible eternity with our Heavenly Father. But we have to invite and pursue this takeover. Invite the Spirit of God to come in and take over and pursue His takeover in our life. Our band's going to close us out with a song that's going to focus on letting the Spirit of God come in and take over. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are this God that that you love us. You create us with purpose. You create us with joy. You create us so that we can have a relationship with you. God, you, you give us your spirit. 
when we give our lives to you. And may we be ones that, that we would give, give you, Holy Spirit, permission to come in and to take over in our lives. To come in and take over and begin to produce this kind of fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May that be what gets produced in our lives as we humble ourselves and depend on you. Invite the Spirit of God to live in our life. God, anybody that doesn't have that Spirit, may you tug on their heart. Spirit, may you convict them. And may they begin a relationship with you. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen.